Uh, so we're speaking in international break in youth development week. Uh, and I know that's something you're very focused on at Blackburn Rovers. Yeah, look, the academy plays a core part of the uh, of the club and has done for a long, long time. And I think in, in going into youth development week, I saw the Football League's um, release earlier this week where they had Blackburn Rovers as one of the two clubs in the championship with the highest percentage of minutes from academy graduates. Um, and it's something we're, we're very, 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 very proud of and continue to work hard to make it better. Oh, brilliant. And I know that's always been a big focus ever since you came in and probably before that as well. Yeah, and I think it's probably why I got this opportunity because of my background in academy football. Um, and I think we've just tried to continue that. And what's really important is to say that we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the work that got on for 10, 15, 20 years before before the current structure took place 18 months ago. So all we've tried to do is continue that. And I think we've had 13 debuts from academy graduates in that in that 18 month period. And 19 players from our academy have gone on to represent the first team because obviously there was a group who was already in that first team group at that stage. So we just try and continue the work that, that's gone on before us. Mm. Superb. And have, have the owners always been totally committed to the academy? Because I, there could be pressure, couldn't there, to do away with the Cat 1? We've seen Burnley have gone Cat 2. Um, you know, you've got some massive clubs kind of on your doorstep. Yeah, of course, yeah. So, yeah, um, it's quite brave to carry on, really, with the Cat 1. Yeah, very, very brave. And I think for a team that's now been out of the Premier League for a number of years, to continue to fund the the, the academy and it it costs the, the academy costs about three and a half million pounds a year to run two and a half of that comes from from the owners or from the club with the rest coming in from subsidies from the premier league so to continue to fund that um just shows a great commitment from the club towards academy football and to be fair it has given the club great return not only in terms of minutes played but also players who've left the club both historically and more recently as well mm. How hard is it with the massive clubs on the doorstep, like Man City, Everton, Liverpool, Man United? Yeah, look, it, it is hard. I think the North West and London are probably the two most competitive areas, uh, certainly in the UK, but but maybe you could argue in, in European football as well. Um, but I think we have to see that as a, as a positive and an opportunity, because if you look at some of our academy graduates, some of them have started their journeys at, at those clubs that you've just mentioned. So... For example, Hayden Carter, uh, Joe Rankin Costello were both at Manchester City as young players in the foundation phase and early stages of the youth development phase. Lewis Travis came to us from Liverpool as an under-16, under-17 player. Um, but then we've also had some players like Adam Wharton, Harry Leonard, Jake Garrett, who've gone the whole way through from our, our own foundation phase. So I think you have to you have to build good relationships with those clubs. And historically, we've had very, very good relationships with the with the the four biggest clubs in the northwest um but also you just have to be aware with what's happening in the market because it's becoming more and more competitive and harder and harder to retain that young talent through your program mm -hmm. um and i think you've you've seen that the club has has lost one or two players on the way but also has done really really well to to attract players as well mm. And I guess it's a very strong recruiting message, the fact that you clearly do believe in youth and give opportunities to players, as you say. So that must be quite strong if you're talking to youngsters and their parents about why they should come to Blackburn. Yeah, 100%. And it doesn't matter whether you're, whether our academy recruitment team are sitting down with the, the parent of an under-9 player or it could be an under-16 player coming out of one of those clubs or a club anywhere else in, in, in England. The message is if you're at Blackburn Rovers and you're doing well enough, you'll get the opportunity. Our squad is small enough, purposefully designed that way, that young players will get the opportunity. And I think then you've had success players with, with two players moving to Premier League clubs from our first team group uh, who have come from our own academy in the last 12 months as well. Mm. And have you been very impressed with the academy? Because I know the academy manager has been there a long time um, and he doesn't really do press, does he? Or social media very much so a lot of people might not know him um, yeah now looks Stuart works diligently in the background very very good at what he does has built a great team around him um, and has continued the work of his predecessors before and has taken the academy to a really really good place as someone who's come himself from a teaching background really understands pedagogy and learning uh, places that at the, at the forefront of everything we do um, uh, he's an excellent academy manager and we're very lucky to have him here yeah superb um, and talking about Adam Wharton, do you, do you see that as a very positive outcome then for all parties, his move? 
Um, look, I, I think there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. First of all, you have to give great credit to the player because of his dedication and hard work over the last 10 to 15 years of, 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 of being or playing football in an organised structure. I think you also have to give great credit both to our academy staff present, but also those who've worked with Adam in the past as well. But the final one, and, and, and this group often come in for criticism, but, but his representatives approach the whole thing in a really sensible way. They realise that, that talent never never fulfills its potential without opportunity and they understood that opportunity was here at Blackburn Rovers because again before my time I understand there was numerous opportunities where where clubs uh, were coming in and uh, approaching uh, Blackburn Rovers for Adam's services and, and he realized that his long-term potential would be better fulfilled coming through the process here so, so you've got those three in the background but then also we tried to build a process which allowed him to come into our first team group so so how do you do that well first of all you keep the squad nice and small uh, nice and tight because if you've got a 27 28 man first team squad not including the young players then the manager is always going to feel obliged to put some of those senior players on the bench secondly then you employ a game model and a way of playing that allows young players to get on the ball and express themselves and showcase their talent um, and, and finally and probably the most important part of the jigsaw is you then employ a head coach who really buys into that process, really understands pedagogy, really understands um, the, the need uh, to, to give young players an opportunity and is brave enough to do that. Um, and then the final piece of the jigsaw is contract management. So, so since I came into the club, we did two contract renewals with Adam in a very, very sh short period of time. And what that means is both parties go into uh, a transfer window with their eyes uh, wide open, knowing what, what might happen. Um, I think with the situation, it, it, it accelerated very, very quickly with Crystal Palace in January. And from in, in 72 hours, had gone from an offer that was nowhere near what we felt was acceptable to one where we felt we had to have a serious conversation about that. It still would have been in our best interest to retain Adam at the club till the end of the season, either on loan or permanently. But the moment the, the players' representatives asks for, ask for the opportunity to speak to the club, then you have to back yourself on what you're going to do because it's no it's no good you sitting here with a parent of a nine-year-old or a 16-year-old, as we've already touched on this conversation, saying this is going to be an opportunity for you to progress and then saying, actually, no, that, that's not going to happen. You then have to open your ears and, and listen to what the player wants. And when the player and his representatives want the opportunity to speak to Crystal Palace, you have to then be open to that if it matches the valuation that the, the club has for that player. Um what was you thinking around selling him in January? Was it the fact that Palace had come in with a good offer and they needed that player at that time? Or would you yeah. like, really like to hang on really till the summer? Yeah, I think the club was quite united. They wanted to keep him till the summer, if need be, and maybe even beyond that as well. Um, but equally, when, when the valuation comes in, which we felt ma matched the valuation that we had for the player, you have to be open to, to let the player then make that decision. Um, I think Adam is irreplaceable in terms of his talent. Well, that's why a Premier League club is paying, paying such a large amount of money. Brave in possession, goes and seeks it uh, under pressure, able to play forward under pressure, able to create opportunities, able to play key passes, has really worked hard on the defensive part of his game over the last 12 months as well. Um, but, but look, he's a terrific footballer. And I think part of Crystal Palace's thinking and part of the players' thinking was, if I go in now, and a managerial change happens at Crystal Palace, you're then going in there with the manager coming in with you already being in the building, which gives you a great advantage. And it's no coincidence. I think he started every game under the new manager at Crystal Palace as well. Yeah. Um, and is he a player that really kind of the data highlights? Because I've heard a lot of club, big clubs talking about him for a while. But sometimes you might sit with someone and they don't think he's a spectacular player. You know, he's not someone who kind of is in your face with what he's doing, but he's obviously yeah. very, very good with a very high amount of potential. Yeah, I think I think his, his data in, in possession of the ball is exceptional, would be up there. And I think our previous head coach here, Yondal, talked about him having Champions League qualities in possession of the ball. And this is from a man who's won the Champions League and been there at the highest level. So, so I think some of that stuff is absolutely through the roof. And I think... Um, I, I remember speaking with the England under-19 coach when he was called into the camp at the beginning of last season. And he, he said, oh, after one training session, the coaching staff and the other players were like, wow, where's this player come from? Just his ability to receive uh, in such tight areas and be so comfortable to receive the ball under pressure. 
I, I think is a, an attribute that we'll see him play at the very, very highest level of the game. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I suppose on like pure event data, he wouldn't come up that highly with goals or maybe assists as well. Yeah, maybe not goals or assists, but in yeah. terms of in terms of his passing percentage and his passing percentage under pressure on his key passes and and uh, kind of the 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 event level data that might sit beneath the headline data that you read on the BBC website, I, I think some of his stuff will be through the roof. Right. Okay. And physically, is he very very good as well? Yeah, I think he he's worked tremendously hard on that part of his game. Um, and I think what you've seen in, in, in his first five or six play- games for Crystal Palace in the Premier League is a player who can adjust to the to the most competitive league in the world physically right. without any issues whatsoever. Yes, there's still room for development as there is with all young players in, in every area of his game. But I think he's worked really, really hard on that part of his game I- I over the last 18 months. Yeah. And his absence has inevitably impacted the team then since he's gone. But... Yeah, I, look, I, I, I don't think... You can you can sell a player for the amount of money that we sold, and and um, have that as a have that not affect the, affect the team straight away. We've got really really good midfielders in the building though. Uh, they've adjusted really well to the new head coach, and now the question we always have to ask, firstly to the academy, is um, who's the next one who's going to come in and replace him, and then secondly to the board of directors, is how we're going to invest that money over the next uh, twelve months to improve the club. Mm. And uh, will it be reinvested? Will it go into the playing squad? Yeah, I think the, the question or my recommendation to the board, and uh, that's my role, is to, to highlight risk and to make recommendations, is that there's four areas we have to look to reinvest in. Firstly, you could say most importantly, but first thing on the list is transfer fees. But secondly, it's no good having transfer fees unless you can pay the wages of those players. So you, you could build in a three-year plan to have a more competitive uh, wage structure um, at the top end of the championship. Thirdly, is is invest back into the academy and the infrastructure of the club. And fourth is don't try and blow it all at once. Have some because you don't know where you, you can't predict rocky moments uh, in, in football or in life. So so have some put to the side as well to say if we need to reinvest some in January or next summer or maybe even in between those two periods, have some put aside for that period as well. So that, that would be my recommendation or has been my recommendation to, to, to the board of directors. Yeah, excellent. Have you got any idea where you sit within the championship in terms of wages? Yeah, I think we're seventeenth to eighteenth as it stands okay. currently. Uh-huh. Um, so, and and the club has consistently overachieved over the last five to six years. Not in terms of the stature of the club, because obviously the the club is a huge club with a very very proud history. But in terms of those clubs that don't have the parachute money, it becomes increasingly hard. And you've seen some clubs have a really good player trading model over the last five to six years, which has allowed them to push above. Um, But what you've seen is very, very few clubs have the dual responsibility of trying to integrate young players in in from the academy, which is a core part of what we do, and also be competitive with with a smaller budget. So that's what we're trying to achieve. That's how we see our our route back to the Premier League. Yeah, because I suppose we are seeing more and more of us and them, aren't we, in the Championship now with... Like it's a long time since you've had the parachute payments, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. But but what you've also seen is every year there is at least one club or two clubs who sit in the top six who don't have that. Mm. Uh, currently, you've got Ipswich sitting, I think, in third place. Last year, you had um, you, you had Luton get promoted as well. Um, but neither of those are doing that with a Cat One Academy and trying to integrate with thirty percent of players from from from, from the academy. So, so you've got to try and get that balance right because, yes, we want young players. Yes, we want a young, small squad. But most importantly, we want to try and win games of football and we believe our model will allow us to do that. Yeah. And you were talking at the start about kind of a, the dual philosophy in terms of young players and also style of play. So was it a real blow for JDT to go? Because he did kind of embody those things, as you said. Yeah, look, when I came to the club last June, um, I was presented by the board with three head coaches that they'd shortlisted um, and we'd uh, agreed on what the strategy and the vision for the club was. And because of that, I asked for for Jan Dahl to, to be added to that interview list. Um, I'd never met him before, never even spoken to him before, but I was aware and had been tracking him from some previous work I'd done on head coach recruitment. So so from that interview process, the board then supported that and we we employed uh, Jan Dahl and he did what we'd asked him to do. He bought, He made the game model come alive. He made us really, really competitive. Uh, and, and last year, we, we came very, very close to, to, to getting into the playoffs, missing out on goal difference, and also had two fantastic runs in both cup, cup competitions as well. 
Um, but I think that the situation had come to a uh, head by the end of January, beginning of February, where I think a head coach change had become inevitable. Um, my role then, as I've alluded to already in this conversation, is to present the board of directors with uh, a list. It's uh, something we've been working on, and I've been quite open that we've been working on for the previous 12 months. Have to highlight the risks, the strengths and weaknesses of anybody who sits on that list. And then the board of directors have to make their recommendation to the owners of, of which of those head coaches get appointed. My job then when that person is in post and when John Eustace comes into post on the back of that is to support him as, po as best as possible as I did with Yondal previously. Mm. Uh, would John Eustace have had the sort of profile you would have looked at then because he doesn't have the same track record in terms of style of play or young players either, I don't think. Well, I disagree slightly on that bit, because again, I think it comes back to the headline details that you're looking at. So to answer those two bits you, 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 you mentioned directly, I think if you look at the style of play at Birmingham City, may, maybe not, although you had seen big changes in that from the beginning of this season, where I think they, they sat sixth or seventh when he left the club. But if you go back further in his playing, in, in his coaching career, um, all the way back to where he started at Kidderminster Harriers, they were very, very open. I think known as the Barcelona of non-league football in terms of some of their attacking play. But that information often disappears into the ether and you only look at the here and now when assessing a head coach's uh, track record. So what I think you saw in, Black, in, in Birmingham City's squad last year was they all of their squad were either under 21 or over 28. They had very few players in that kind of in that middle section. Um, so, and, and I think, as I've already touched on there, is he, he also left the club in the playoff positions when, when, when he left Birmingham City in, in, in the autumn. So I think some of the headline data might not suggest that that is the perfect match, but when you scratch beneath and do the research, there's a lot of, a lot of alignment with the way we want to try and do things as well. But I think what's really important is head coach has to be allowed the opportunity to get on the grass and implement his style of play. And in John's first five weeks here, I think we had double game weeks because of our success in the FA Cup every single week. So this is the first extended period now where he's been on the grass with the players, both last week leading into the middle game, but also this week now for two weeks in the international break. But I think he'll need the full uh, expanse of this of this season, but also pre-season as well, for him to be able to put his own slant on, on, on our game model, because that's what it's about. You employ a, a coach who fits your game model, but then you ask him not to try and replicate that because he isn't Yondal. He's got slightly different beliefs in how the game should be played, but they're not completely uh, unaligned with how we, we want to develop players and, and, and progress the group here at the club. And has it been a major problem, the lack of that centre forward, would you say? With because it seems like you do play a lot of good football. The in-possession stats have been good, but just kind of that finishing touch, you know. I know uh, it's yeah, look, I, look, yeah, high I, numbers, yeah, but look, he's not yeah, a number yeah, nine, is yeah, he? Without, without wanting to make this conversation too stats heavy, I think yeah. our, our, our open play XG, for what that's worth, was in the top four in the championship um, going into January. So we know we were creating loads and loads of chances through through open play. I'd also counter that by saying we've got the leading score in the championship as well. And he's the leading score in the FA Cup, although we won't be adding any more goals to that after our exit in the last round. But but what we've done there, and, and it's important that this then loops back to, to the recruitment piece as well, is when you're recruiting for that game model, if you think back to our first transfer window uh, in the summer of 2022, I think we had absolute clarity on how much money we had to spend in transfer fees and clarity on what, what we had in terms of the wage bill to play with as well. And, and that makes it not easy, but certainly easier to recruit. And, and from that, and from the game model, first of all, we identified we needed a central defender who was really comfortable in possession and could play as part of a back four or part of a back five because we'd lost Lenahan from the group and Van Heck had been in, which was a really successful loan from Brighton. And um, we bought uh, Andy Watson into our recruitment team, heavily data-led, and, and it was his work that, that led us to to focus on Dom Hyam, who was a player who'd never ever been on, on the club's recruitment um, processes before. But also looking further up the pitch, we realised that if we wanted to press and play defensively the way we wanted to, where we had to be more effective as a counter-pressing team, we wanted to add something different into that area of the pitch. So Ben Rosen, who was our head of performance at the time, uh, did a lot of good work for us there. And it was, it was his uh, shortlist that he created for the recruitment team that highlighted Sammy Schmodich for two reasons. Firstly, because of his running data uh, in a relegated team at Peterborough United. 
but secondly for his goal return, especially in the limited games he played as a 10 because Peter pretended to use him on the left in the championship. But in that small pool, uh, we felt we could add that. And and, and from the, and, and, and again, just to highlight, Sammy wasn't a player who'd ever featured on the club's recruitment processes before. Obviously, they knew who he was because he played in the championship, but he'd never sat on any long lists or short lists here. So, so we signed those two players as part of the six players we signed last summer. Uh, and, and both of those, Dom was player of the season for the club last year. Sammy, I would suggest, would be a very strong contender for the player of the season this year without wanting to preempt that vote. So, so I think that that shows where the whole piece can be joined up. Um, I think going back to strikers as well, the, the striker we brought into the club last summer was George Hurst, who who this season is leading the line or until injury was leading the line um, for the club, which has surprised everybody, I think. Well, not surprised everybody, but but has done fantastically in the championship and currently sit third in the table Ipswich. And I think it's no coincidence that when, when George was injured before Christmas, Ipswich's first target and number one target in that position was our centre forward because our models of how we play and, and, and our playing style and our coaching philosophies are very, very aligned between the two clubs. So, so it was no coincidence that they, they come in for Sam Gallagher. So the big piece of work in January was retain Sam Gallagher. That was my, 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 my kind of risk report to, to, to the board again was be aware that, that Sam is very, very hard to, to replace unless you're going to spend two and a half to three million in the transfer window. So um, it, it's no coincidence that, that, that um, Ipswich's two pieces of work on centre forwards are very, very, very aligned to ours. Um yeah, and then obviously uh, Duncan Maguire, that, that did get a lot of uh, publicity. So, first of all, was that a big miss, not being able to bring him in in, in that position? Yeah, look, I think Duncan was a, a player that our recruitment team had highlighted and worked on for a long, long time. Lewis Evans, who heads the data recruitment, had flagged him here and Lewis had done a lot of work in the background on him. But we knew we weren't going to have transfer fees to spend in January initially. So our initial approaches to Orlando were about him coming in on loan, which at that stage was a very clear that's not going to happen. Uh, so so we'd kind of moved on and were focusing on other targets at that stage. Um, and then when the Adam Wharton transfer agree happened, we, we thought we might be able to do something permanently. We agreed a deal. I think it was about £2.3 million. I have to be careful because it's pounds and dollars changing my head all the time. But it was about £2.3 million to purchase him initially which uh, allowed us to then initiate conversations further with the player and his representatives. But unfortunately, we were unable to then do a permanent transfer um, at that stage. He then chose to come to the UK to try and negotiate a deal with another championship club who'd agreed a transfer fee. And at that stage, we became aware that it might be possible to, to do a loan with an option. The option was a slightly higher figure. It was about 3.5 million. You might say, well, why is there a difference in 1.2? Well, uh, Orlando have to protect themselves. And if he was to come in and in the 18, 20 games or whatever we had left at that stage, a little bit like Tom Cannon last season, who goes in, has a good loan at Preston, all of a sudden he goes from a player who, who is not in Everton's first team squad, certainly at that stage, to someone who's going for, I don't know what he moved to, to Leicester in the end. Was it 5 million, 7 million, something like that? So so there has to be something that protects, protects them. And by the way, that's only an option. That's not an obligation to buy. Um, and, and obviously then when we were able to get that done on transfer deadline day, we were then really, really disappointed that we weren't able to get that over the line and have Duncan here in the building. Yeah, yeah, right. So, um, yeah, what, what actually happened there? Have we ever, has that been disclosed fully? I've obviously read uh, quite a bit about it. And it was basically kind of not pressing a button, wasn't it, on the um, paperwork to the Football League? Yeah, look, I think... It's purely a human error that's made that happen. Um, I, I don't really want to go into the details of, of, of what will happen on the back of that. Um, the board of directors know my thoughts on it. And I think I, I, me trying to support the recruitment departments, I have to do for their role. We can't have it where the recruitment department are working really, really hard for maybe three or four months to secure a signing. And we're unable to complete that because of the administration uh, on, on that. That should be the most simple part of that. Um, we know from previous lessons, if we look back at last January, where something similar, not exactly the same, but something similar happened. And I think through the through the process and we went through last January, there, there, there was three problems that previously the club had always worked with the administration being based at Ewood Park, where they are, and the sporting side via the medicals and the, the, the press and everything are here at the training ground where I speak to you from today. 
So, so my first recommendation to the board was we have to be in one place. We can't be in two places when it's on transfer deadline day. So all of a sudden we bought the administration here. Secondly, because we had an FA Cup game, ironically against Birmingham City um, on transfer deadline day in 2023, um, the, the, the chief executive and the board of directors weren't here. And obviously, as a, 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 I'm not a director of the club, although my title is director of football, I, I'm not able to sign transfers off or, or do that high level business. So they have to be present when that problem or when when that challenge is, is, is going to be hit. And finally, there was a small IT issue. So the third part was IT also have to be on site. They can't go home at five o'clock. They have to be here in case there's a problem from an IT. And I think there was an IT problem with West Ham on transfer deadline day this year, where eventually FIFA signed that transfer off. So you put all of those things in place, but ultimately you're still open to, to human error. We're all we're all humans with that. Um, and I have to think I, I think in the future we have to make sure that 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 we can't be vulnerable to that happening again. Mm. So was it happening very, very late in the day? Was that why that problem not, arose? Not, was... not, 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 not too late in the day. I mean, it was it was 9.30 when I think the transfer got signed off. So you've still got an hour and a half spare. We were still able to do one piece of business business beyond that. But this was just a loan. I know it's a loan from the MLS, but it wasn't it wasn't an overly uh, onerous loan. Last year, when we were trying to do the Lewis O'Brien deal, it was being held up because it was an obligation, which means all of the pre-contract has to be agreed uh, before because it is an obligation, not an option to buy. And I think at that stage, and I think this is this is in, in, in the public realm, we felt as a club, and one of the basis of our appeal was we felt that the Football League was wrong to be challenging us on a clause in that contract that was couldn't exist. They were asking us what Lewis's uh, wages would be in League Two, even though we couldn't be in League Two on the length of his contract because it had to be triggered on the Premier League and it was a three-year contract. So um, we felt that that put an unnecessary delay at a crucial stage. Um, and that was a really, really complicated, big transfer and had to be done. So there was a challenge with that. Th this year, that wasn't the case. No. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember with Lewis O'Brien, I think you said it was on your head, wouldn't it? Or you would take responsibility. And, 100%. Yeah, and I mean, you obviously took quite a bit of flat with the Duncan Maguire as well, but it sounds like you couldn't action that anyway if you're not a director of the club. Yeah, look, I, I, I still stand by the, what I said last January and that ultimately transfers have to come to me and I'm happy to sit here. You sit here in my position and one of the reasons why I wanted to step out of the academy positions I've worked in previously and, and go into this role was I, I've got no issue res accepting responsibility and you have to do that when you're in a position that I do now. But ultimately, I think you have to ask uh, to make sure that the club gives you the absolute support to, to, to get the, the simple part of the transfer across the line. Uh, and we learn and we move on from that. And, and the board of directors are completely uh, clear on what my feelings are we need to do going forwards. Mm. Um, yeah, and regarding the owners, do, do you have any direct contact with them at all? Because I know they haven't been to a game, have they, for many, many years now? Yeah, I do have direct contact to them. My day-to-day -day contact through them is, is through their representative here at the club. Um, but yeah, I do have direct contact. But the way the club is structured is the decision-making process at the club always goes through the board of directors back to the owners. And that would be the same at mo most clubs. Most clubs have the board of directors who, who make executive decisions here on behalf of the ownership group. And I know they've had trouble getting funds out of India to the club. And I think there's going to be the court case has been adjourned until August now in India. Um, so will that impact the club over the summer in terms of uh, transfer business? I've been told that it won't impact uh, on our transfer business going into the summer. We've already got clear plans of what we're trying to do. Um, and we know what the summer will look like for us as a, as a football club. Um, I think, as I've said previously, it's a geopolitical in, uh, it's a geopolitical challenge that the ownership group are facing. Um, it, it's not the football club that's being challenged. It, it, it's the enormous global uh, business that they run, um, of which we're a, 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 a small but for them very significant part of that business. Um, but for us, we've got clarity of what we need to do going into the summer. We know because of the way we've managed contracts. We don't have an enormous amount of players coming out of contract going into the summer. So um, all of our players that we feel will, will attract interest going into the summer, we know we're in a very good position because of the work we've done on contracts over the last 18 months. Um, and, and we're in a confident position to, to, to go into the summer and hopefully have the squad come out of it in a better position than it goes into it. 
Yeah. Superb. And do they remain very committed to the club and to the plan? A hundred percent committed to the club and to the plan. Um, I think one of the questions I asked when I first came into this is, 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 uh, what, why, are you, why are you bringing a director of football in now? Why do you want to change this? And I think they understood that they had to approach it differently to how the club had been running in the past because of how competitive the championship had become. Um, I think it, again, it's on public record. Four players had left the club before I came in, um, without a transfer fee coming back into the club. Uh, two of those being academy graduates, uh, Lenahan and Niambi, but also uh, we'd had Rothwell go to Bournemouth and eventually uh, Ben Brereton Diaz, uh, who was going into the last year of his contract when I came in, obviously moving on a free last summer. Now, if you're going to generate a player trading model, you can't have that. That doesn't mean you won't have some players. Some players you have deliberately choose to let their contract run down in negotiation with that player. But ultimately, you have to try and plan ahead and create that player trading model because otherwise you can't be competitive at the top end of the championship. Uh, I've, I've had a look at four clubs who I think have, have done really well at the top end of the championship in the last uh, or in the most recent period. But I think if you look at Brentford in the five years before their promotion, they generated enormous transfer funds by doing a really good player trading model. And I think they invested the headline figures, 50% of that back into transfer funds. Brighton, it was over 100% of it back into transfer funds large percentage of it from Luton, although a different model, but from Luton going up last year. And I think Coventry have done absolutely brilliantly, obviously fantastic performance from them in the cup uh, quarterfinal last week. But if you look, it's their sales of, of, of Jicaris and Harmer last summer that have allowed them to invest brilliantly back into their squad and kept them competitive despite losing two players who've moved on in Harmer's case to the Premier League, but in Jicaris's case, to the very highest stage in, in, in Europe and now being talked about uh, as being one of the big moves back into the Premier League this summer. Mm, definitely. Oh, and just the last one from me, Greg. Mm. Uh, I know when you put the job ad on the site, which, which is very good, um, I think it said um, your ambition of becoming a Premier League club. So it, is that still an ambition? Very much? Yeah, 100%. That the vision of the club to become a sustainable Premier League club hasn't changed. How are we going to do that? No different. We want to integrate young players into a squad, have a particular style of football, have the head coach who buys into that model. And then that, all of that generates a player trading model. Now, it's not just to do here and say, doesn't our balance sheet look great because our squad value is increased? You're doing that in order to generate value, in order to be able to uh, invest back into the transfer market and make yourself more competitive at the top end of the league. That's the that's the model that we're trying to trying to bring in here to the club. We're 18 months into that project now. You're seeing some signs of it. Uh, I appreciate uh, the supporters will be looking and saying, well, but we're sitting, uh, we're 17th in the league right now. How can we do that? But we really, really believe that that will allow us to be competitive at the top end of the championship and then beyond that. Yeah. And are you still very committed to the role in the club yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a fantastic football club with a very, very proud history very very proud history proud way of doing things we've got a clear identity of the way we want to develop players the way we want to play football um and and yeah we're just focusing now on the the next game against Ipswich on on good friday yeah fantastic thanks so much for your time greg no problem thanks a lot simon appreciate it thank All you right.